The KT mass extinction, or Cretaceous tertiary mass extinction, or N Cretaceous mass extinction. This is the large mass extinction event that occurred at the end of the Cretaceous period, ending the Mesozoic era. It's one of the big five mass extinction events of the Phanerozoic eon, and many life forms would go extinct during this event, including the dinosaurs. The origin of this mass extinction is still debated, and it is actually, of all the mass extinction events, the one that really causes the most debate and is the most politicized in the scientific world. There are actually some different ideas about how it happened, why it happened, and we're going to explore those with this lecture. So to summarize the mass extinction, the end of the Cretaceous, this diagram here, which we've used before, showing the biodiversity over the Phanerozoic and how it's increased with time, but it is punctuated by several large mass extinction events. The KT mass extinction, simply the fifth and latest one of these. And it's a significant drop in the percentage of life forms, whether you're talking species, 75% of all species, or genera. No matter how you quantify it, it is a large number of organisms that were affected. So of these, many of which we discussed previously, the dinosaurs, the pterosaurs, the marine reptiles of all different kinds, many different kinds of plants would go extinct. However, most mammals, amphibians, birds, crocodiles, other creatures survive. This seemingly implausible scenario where some of your more abundant and dominant creatures would die off and others would survive is perplexing, and it's still being addressed today in scientific study. We think we have answers to a lot of it. What we do know of the KT event is mostly from rocks in North America. And this is a cool little diagram which shows where the research is coming from in different areas, whether it's the Denver Basin, the Raton Basin in New Mexico, and into Colorado, the Hell Creek Formation in Montana, the Williston Basin in Western Canada. All these places are in the U.S. or Canada, North American sites. That's where we have KT boundary layers exposed. The other areas are in other places in the world from India to Antarctica to New Zealand to Europe, but mostly North America. And what we found about the extinction itself is that the rate of extinction was different depending on the type of animal. It occurred very quickly for the marine animals and it was more gradual on land. That's one idea. And there are likely multiple causes. While we are dominated by the asteroid impact hypothesis, there are other very good explanations as to what caused this mass extinction. Let's look at some of the possible causes. First, death by impact. How dramatic. This is the asteroid impact hypothesis which was put forward by Luis and Walter Alvarez in 1980. And they were looking at the element iridium in a KT boundary layer at various places around the world. And they ended up having the idea that this was fallout from some kind of asteroid or comet. They looked at this KT boundary where this impact would have occurred and Commonly, it's symbolized by KTB is the KT boundary. And at this layer, there are sediments, which are enriched in certain elements, like iridium, which characterize this impact event. The iridium is uh, from the impactor itself. Iridium is a, a rare earth element, and it is present in very minute abundances in most surface rocks on Earth. But it's in higher abundance in certain meteorites. The Alvarez has got the idea that this iridium enriched layer had its origin in an asteroid impact. Here's a picture of the Alvarez's at the outcrop, and then here's a typical KT boundary outcrop in southeastern Colorado near Trinidad. You need the smoking gun, 
where did the impact occur? It's present nowhere on the surface, but it's possibly lurking under the surface of the Yucatan Peninsula. So you can't see it, the crater itself, in outline. And there's a, a long history on how this was discovered, but it's thought that the crater is present underneath the surface, buried by younger rocks. Here on land, this shows a line of sinkholes, cenotes, which formed where the groundwater conditions are changing enough to give you dissolution in the sinkholes forming here, uh, because you're going from the rim of the crater into the crater itself. There are some clues on the surface that would point to the location of Chicxulub crater, but really it was from drill hole data from the Mexican oil company Pemex, and that led to further exploration. And so we think that we penetrated this impact structure now with further studies and seen actually the breccia layer and a glass layer that would represent the actual impact crater itself. This impact would have caused uh, enormous environmental effects. The blast itself certainly would have been regional in extent. This occurred in a shallow marine shelf environment of the Gulf of Mexico, which is a little bit different from today. It was similar, but in a shallow marine environment, so it would have set up a huge displacement of water and tsunami wave, so impact tsunami, which would have traveled up the shorelines all across the Western Hemisphere. Vaporized impact rock would have been transported into the stratosphere and probably would have shrouded the earth and limited the sunlight and caused what's called an impact winter, which would have affected photosynthesis and the whole food chain as a result. The duration of this is uncertain. It's all subject to modeling. And whether this would have lasted years or tens of years, certainly not hundreds of thousands of years, but long enough to disrupt the the cycle of life. So this impact might explain the rapid extinction rate of certain organisms because this is an instantaneous event and it can explain how changes occur over a very short time period. But there are some issues with it. As with all of these, there's debate plus and minus about each one. Well, because the impact hypothesis has taken up all the oxygen in the room in terms of the discussion of the cause of this extinction event, there are legitimate scientists doing legitimate scientific work that question this idea. One of these is Gerda Keller, and she's done most of her work at Princeton, and here she is in the outcrop. And the bottom line is she thinks that the Chicxulub impact crater is quite possibly older than the KT boundary layer itself, meaning that the impact occurred at the latest part of the Cretaceous, but not at the very end. The reason why she says that, there's still Cretaceous rocks filling up the crater, and then the KT boundary layer is above that. A number of other people think this too. It's just coming up with the sufficient data. So she's met a lot of headwind with her ideas. She's done research in the Yucatan and in the Caribbean as well, trying to support this. And her bottom line is that the crater is too old to be the one responsible for the KT boundary event. So this impact, if it happened at Chicxulub, was older than the KT boundary. There's a number of different lines of evidence that she used, and it's kind of cool because she has looked at the paleontology of various microscopic marine animals like the four ams and looked at their abundances and seen how they have been affected in the rock record and they record the kt boundary nicely enough but in the same rocks as she's pulling that information the impact breccia from chicxulub sits farther down and so that's one reason why she's saying that the chicxulub impact occurred before the mass extinction event. The KT boundary iridium anomaly suggests, if that really is from an asteroid impact, it suggests that there was another impact somewhere else that we don't know of, or the iridium could be coming from somewhere else. And we know 
very little about deep mantle plumes. Iridium probably present in percentages greater in the mantle than they are on the surface. And so mantle-related plume volcanism might be an answer to the iridium anomaly. But it's a question. And she's doing good geologic work in different fields, pulling it all together. And there are some problems with Chicxulub, and there's a lot of resistance to these because so many people are invested in the impact idea. So her bottom line is uh, the impact might have been a factor. It could have been another one. And with changes in dating, even if it was the KT boundary age impact, it's not necessarily the only factor in the mass extinction. And she goes on to do work in India in the Deccan Traps to demonstrate that that is the other major factor. So impact or no, it's not the only option. Well, the other possible option I just alluded to is Keller's work into the Deccan Traps volcanism. So death by volcanism. It's not just her and her research group, but there are others involved as well that have studied the Deccan Traps and dated them and linked their eruption directly to the KT boundary itself. I've shown this diagram previously. It summarizes the age relations of the Deccan Traps eruption. Deccan is in India. That's what it looks like there. And there were three major pulses to the eruption. This is a diagram showing age and the volume of the different pulses. And the second pulse was the majority, about 80% of most of the volume of the lavas in the second pulse. This shows the age diagram from older Cretaceous to younger tertiary and the KT boundary layer itself right here. So phase one was in the Cretaceous, phase two spanned the KT boundary, and phase three came afterward. So the Deccan traps had already been established before the boundary and were going gangbusters right at the boundary and continued shortly into the tertiary. So it's thought the second pulse lasted for less than a million years and that erupted period span the KT boundary. And that's when most of this 512,000 cubic kilometers of basaltic lava erupted. So these eruptions, remember it's not the lava that kills, it's the gases. Massive volumes of lava extruding all this gas into the atmosphere, both sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide, lead to atmospheric effects, significant long-term and short-term effects. So it's thought that the sulfur dioxide and getting up high enough into the stratosphere would remain there as an aerosol and would actually block sunlight for a short period of time, thus cooling the planet. But then carbon dioxide would produce a more long-term warming effect, so increasing the greenhouse effect there. Kind of a double whammy of climate change fairly quickly in a geologic time sense would have unleashed havoc. And this kind of havoc we've Earth has experienced before with the camp eruption at the end of the Triassic, with the Siberian traps at the end of the Permian. So the timing was right. The effect was likely significant. This was definitely a major contributor to the KT mass extinction. So at a minimum, this is a co-conspirator with the impact to produce the KT mass extinction. Now for some other possibilities. This idea is called death by plate tectonics, and this involves drain, mix, and cool. This is shown by the late Cretaceous marine regression, when all the shallow seas drained off the continents, which was a major shift in environmental conditions all at once. And so these broad Cretonic seas, like the North American Interior Seaway, would eventually drain off the continent and all the life that was in those seas would have been affected. Drain, mix, and cool. What are we talking about? Why is it happening? Well, if we look at the timeline for Cretaceous, here's the beginning of the Cretaceous and here is the end. If we look at the ages of oceanic crust and the volume of those different age periods, we can plot it over here and it says oceanic crust 
production in terms of millions of cubic kilometers per million years. So it's how much oceanic crust is being produced per million years. So you can see there's kind of an average. There's about 20 million cubic kilometers of oceanic crust produced per million years. So that's kind of the baseline. And during the Cretaceous, there is this pulse where a whole lot more oceanic crust was produced. It doesn't mean then that the Earth got bigger because there was more crust. But what that probably means is the mid-ocean ridges were, for whatever reason, operating in kind of overdrive, producing more oceanic crust. This would have meant that subduction processes would have had to increase to keep up. But also a more active mid-ocean ridge would have probably been more buoyant because of increased heat. It would have sat a little bit higher because of increased buoyancy. And it's thought that it would have displaced just enough ocean water to push that volume of water up onto the continents. So it's thought that this increased production of oceanic crust at mid-ocean ridges was the reason why so many of these shallow cratonic seas occurred in the first place. So when mid-ocean ridges started increasing in volume production of crust, that's when the seas more or less started to transgress under the cratons. And when production tailed off towards the end, that's when the seas drained off. So this decrease in oceanic crust production in the late Cretaceous caused sea levels to fall and the seas to drain off. Of course, the shallow marine areas would be exposed as a result. Uh, and benthic creatures would suffer uh, greatly. The nectonic or swimmers uh, and pelagic organisms, they would also have to move and change and everything would be disrupted in those areas. The oceans would become more well mixed, as I said, the seas are draining off into the deeper ocean basins. And as that water mixes with the deeper, colder ocean waters, that deeper, colder water is going to come up to more shallow levels. And on the whole, the oceans will become a little bit colder. So more circulation, more mixing of this water uh, will cause a cooling effect. And this is the idea behind drain, mix, and cool. So this directly affects shallow marine organisms, but it also indirectly affects other marine organisms. So, well, and also indirectly affects land organisms that were once separated by a seaway that aren't anymore, but also the climate caused by the seaway would have changed as the seaway leaves, the climate around there would have changed to some degree. But it's not directly, this is affecting shallow marine organisms. Another factor in the extinction could have been death by disease and competition. So this is the idea of Dr. Bob Bakker. In the 1980s, he espoused the idea that disease and competition were a significant factor in the extinction of at least the land animals. What he did was he studied the Hell Creek Formation in Montana, which, if you remember, it is right below the KT boundary, right up to it. And he looked at the diversity of dinosaurs in the formation. He saw that there was a change in the diversity from the lower part of the Hell Creek to the upper part right at the boundary. And what he saw was a decrease in the diversity of the different kinds of dinosaurs. At the beginning, there were all sorts of different kinds of dinosaurs. And by the time you get to the end of Hell Creek formation time, uh, it was dominated by only a couple different species. Triceratops was the main one. About three quarters of all fossils were triceratops. And so he quantified this using an ecological term called evenness. And he basically applied the fossil count and tried to quantify it and estimate the evenness of the ecosystem. And really all that is, is a measure of the diversity of the ecosystem. The more even it is, the more diverse, where there is no dominant organism. And the more uneven it is means that one organism is dominating, and typically that's not a healthy ecosystem. And so he did this for various Cretaceous rock formations, and what he saw in the Hell Creek was that there was a decrease in the evenness, in the diversity uh, throughout the formation. And so it was becoming more and more dominated by certain species towards the end. So his idea is that the 
dinosaurs, at least represented by the Hell Creek Formation, weren't part of a healthy ecosystem and they were in the process of dying out before the KT boundary. Some people have challenged this, but he's adamant about it and others are as well. It's one of his dinosaur heresies, which he wrote a book on in the 80s and this was part of it. Remember, he's the one that was espousing the fact that dinosaurs were warm-blooded, feathers, and so he's no stranger to controversy. And this idea is that the sea level is falling because of whatever reason, but we've just explained why they were falling. The seas draining off allowed land bridges to form and mixing of previously isolated animal populations. And then they would bring in pathogens that they were accustomed to, but the new populations that they were mixing with weren't. And so we've seen this in many different types of animals over time. So he thought that animals being allowed to mix would bring disease and then they would directly compete as well for whatever resources were available. And in previously isolated populations, if you introduce new animals that are superior, then he thinks that that was an issue. Falling sea levels allowed this mixing of populations of land animals, resulting in the, at least part of the mass extinction relating to the land animals. That's his take in terms of land animals. The drain mix and cool was the marine life. And so both of those, the drain mix and cool and this one, are related to the same phenomenon. The draining off of the shallow seas would have caused effects both on land with the land bridges and mixing populations and such, and in the oceans. And the rates of extinction would have been different in each case, with the marine organisms possibly going more rapidly than the land animals. So the point of this lecture is not to be an exhaustive review of all of these mechanisms. It's merely to point out that there are different possible explanations of why the KT mass extinction occurred. And they can be debated by serious people, and each one of them has merit in their own right. Bottom line is uh, there isn't a single explanation. Each one of these scenarios that I've laid out has its pluses and minuses. Uh, it's likely that there were several factors involved, even ones that I haven't covered here could have been involved as well. As is usually the case, it's typically a more complex situation than what we usually know. We do know that atmospheric CO2 and SO2, oceanic chemistry and circulation, disease, these are factors that can cause mass extinction. Uh, they certainly have in other mass extinction events, uh, but they're just not as sexy as an asteroid impact. Hollywood isn't going to make a movie about changing oceanic chemistry and circulation, but they love movies about impacts and that kind of thing. So it's not as Hollywood, but just mundane kind of changes over long periods of time or even short periods of time are just as important as the more dramatic ones. Just a little KT mass extinction humor. <laughs>